Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden, and I am joined today by the return of Julia Yaffe to the podcast. (laughs) GQ correspondent, but really you've you've been on, I think, certainly once, but at least a couple times. And you've been writing, you've been slaving away at writing a book about that's part memoir about growing up and leaving Russia, about Russia. It's actually about Russian women and the history of the um, radical feminist experiment, experiment that the Soviet Union carried out and how my family's story, like the women in my family, how their stories intertwine with that. And you, I, I never want to ask writers like, so how is it, how is it coming? But when, when is it allegedly or supposed to be published? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was on track to meet my third deadline and then COVID and that messed it up. So now I'm hoping to finish it by the end of the year. And then I guess whenever they get it out after that. Right. And and just for the record, you are a healthy, beautiful young woman and you got COVID and you got it bad. Am I correct to say you've been struggling uh, it with was- it for weeks? Yeah, it was it was really mild and uh, kind of mild for a long time. And then all of a sudden, I just went off a cliff at the end of week three and uh, couldn't breathe. And my oxygen levels dropped and I had to go on steroids like the president felt amazing on steroids. Are you going to become <laughs> aggressive and start tweeting? Uh, no. no, but what did happen is uh, I so my PCP told me to, to go to the ER and my sister, who's a doctor who took care of COVID patients at the height of the pandemic, she was working in the ICU and the ER uh, in April and May, was like, you're just going to waste time sitting in the waiting room. Here are some steroids. If they don't help, then we then you can go to the hospital. So within like four hours of starting a much, much milder um, steroid than the president is on. I was like, yes, let's pound beers. <laughs> I felt amazing. I wanted to party. It was literally <laughs> four hours. And I called my sister. I was like, can I have a beer? And she was like, you were just packing for the hospital. Can you just <laughs> chill out for a second? So I, I kind of for once feel for the president. <laughs> <laughs> well, does that mean like just speculating this whole idea? I mean, we never know you know, what the truth about his health is, but, you know, he's in what we're recording this when he's in like day, allegedly day five or so out of the hospital. Yeah. Well, so just speaking from personal experience, I was on a much milder, um, steroid, but you know, when it left, when the course of treatment was over and I was tapered off the steroids and they left my system, I crashed and I had to go to the ER. So you ended up Uh, going back for oxygen. No, not for oxygen, but like they couldn't, you know, they did, uh, ran a bunch of tests and took x-rays and found my lungs were partially collapsed, you know, it was so great. But, um, you know, talking to doctors, I know that I won't name, uh, they're saying, you know, and they're all saying that basically, you know, that video of him coming home from Walter Reed and standing on the balcony and clearly struggling for breath, the fact that he was struggling for breath while on dexamethasone, which is what they give people after they get like brain surgery so that the brain doesn't swell and push up on the skull and get damaged, uh, on remdesivir, on like a ton of antibodies that he still can't breathe like that means that he has it pretty bad. That's interesting. So right, that's, well, I guess, I guess we'll see. I mean, I, I always get, we just, our listeners, we taped this on a Thursday for release on Tuesday in general. And last week, Caitlin and I taped it and we're talking about all the things that had happened, you know, in the past 48 hours of recording it. And then over the, then the whole weekend happened and the president got COVID and the whole White House. So we didn't even know we were still talking about RBG, you know, that, that just seemed like Who? decades ago. <laughs> So, okay. So without knowing that, but I'm, I'm super excited to have you on today, Co-Splaining, because um, our guest, as you know, is Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, who has written this memoir tell-all called Melania and Me, The Rise and Fall of My Friendship with the First Lady. Um, and Julia, you wrote one of, I think, just the profile of Melania in 2016. It was in GQ. 
uh, you were the one who, being the intrepid reporter that you are, and also the Russian Eastern European expert that you are, you went over to Slovenia. You track. You were the one who tracked down her brother, her half brother that yeah, no, she no one knew about. Yeah, uh, it was it was kind of crazy. I had a fixer because I obviously don't speak Slovenian. I had a fixer translator. And we were just, you know, wheeling around Slovenia, which is really beautiful, has incredible wine and incredible food. I got to say, I kind of want to go back. Uh, and, you know, we, we went to the little town that she's from and w- which I got to say, like she had a pretty privileged upbringing for, uh, you know, Slovenia and kind of Cold War communist era Slovenia, you know, her. Her dad owned a bunch of vintage luxury cars. They had several properties. Like she was, she did not come from a poor background. She was well, not he like was in that in that Soviet era. I mean, he had to be a top apparatchik. It wasn't because he was a successful businessman, as it were. He had. Uh, to- I, don't, I, I I disagree. I think you have to. It's a different kind. It's a similar but very slightly different kind of skill. I think he was in the Communist Party. Um, you know, my grandfather had to join the Communist Party to go anywhere in his career. Um, it was kind of in that very cynical era when nobody believed in anything. And, you know, you joined a party because you needed to. Otherwise, you would just never advance in your career. And it opened up a whole world of connections. And, you know, even if it was you got like communist era Yugoslavia was a lot milder and softer than the Soviet Union. Like they. um you know, on the spectrum from, you know, going west to east, they were pretty close. Like in the Soviet Union, we considered them like basically Europe, basically the West. And they had a much better economy. And um, he was very good at using his connections to um, create a thriving business as much as one could in that era. So that takes a certain kind of skill and business acumen too. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then you found this, this brother. This. Right. So we were so we were in this uh, in this little town and my uh, fixer, who is Slovenian, said, you know, I heard that this guy is telling me that he knows about Melania's illegitimate half brother. And I was like, what? And she and we were like, this sounds like it's made up. It's probably bullshit. Sorry. And um, but we figured, OK, well, we'll figure it out. So I changed my changed my ticket. and We decided to go and investigate and find him and go to the archives and dig up all the kind of court documents because, um, you know, Melania's father is very similar to Melania's husband. And um, what happened is he impregnated a woman uh, that he was dating before he met Melania's mother. Uh, he, When she told him that, he, that she was pregnant, he told her to get an abortion. Uh, she said, basically, fuck off, had the baby. And then demanded child support from him. And he took her to court. They went up all the way up to the Slovenian Supreme Court. Uh, He appealed it all the way up there because he didn't want to pay child support um, until a paternity test proved that he was the father and he had to pay. And um, he was basically never recognized by the family. Melania didn't know about him. But we went to the little coal mining town where he lived. She had no idea. She had no idea. She had no idea. So this was probably, you know, to be fair, probably a really unpleasant surprise for her. Right. But it, it, and, and then, and then, and then you ended up doing this quite a good, because nobody, when she sort of came on the national scene as his wife in the presidential race, um, of course they had both been sort of fixtures of, I don't want to say even New York society, but certainly the New York social world but nobody really knew her. They didn't know her background. They knew she was Slovenian. They knew she had come to America as a model. And beyond that, I mean, she's always been, as we know, very Sphinx-like. She doesn't talk a lot. She seems to accept this kind of very decorative role um, in, in Donald Trump's life. And, um, and then so when you wrote your profile, you, you just provided this kind of fascinating wealth of background, let alone these revelations about her half brother. But um, she was, I think because it was for GQ, wasn't she going to talk to you? And then when this came out, 
She, uh, she did talk to me. She spoke to me on the phone a, a couple of times and she yeah. was very sweet until she realized what was going on. And then she immediately threatened to sue me. And she yeah. said she had a team of lawyers ready to go. <laughs> Um, you know, it's interesting, though, it seems to be her personality, like everybody who knew her from back home in Slovenia, said that she was always incredibly shy, incredibly private, um, very introverted. Nobody really knew much about her even there. They were just like, oh, she and her mom were always stylish and beautiful. And her family, you know, was quite well to do. And yeah, it's like nobody... I, I didn't meet any, even like uh, I talked to this wonderful man in Slovenia who was her boyfriend for a very long time before she left Slovenia to pursue a modeling career in Western Europe before she came to America. He was also a model and um, had gone blind in a freak skiing accident, but they were together for like two years and he barely knew her. And, it was, and it's just what, that's kind of how she is. When you spoke to her before she, <laughs> threatened her team of lawyers. Yeah. What was she like? Like, you, I mean, was she chatty? Because it's hard for me to imagine her being chatty. Although, as we'll learn from this author, Stephanie, that who was friends with her for 15 years, she they would go for two hour lunches. And I don't know. She just struck me as just very kind of um, vapid, like, but in the sense of like, there's just nothing in there. Um, and in all her interviews uh, that I watched before interviewing her, it was just, you know, the same. She just relies on these kind of um, just like little phrases that she's clearly picked up in English that she just kind of uses as kind of bricks in a wall to protect herself from everybody else. And she doesn't reveal much and it doesn't seem like there's much to reveal. It just seemed like kind of she got what she wanted. She um, came to the U.S. Like many Eastern European women, she seemed to be focused on survival and using her looks, you know, in the brief window of time in which a woman's looks can do all that for, for her. Um, she got her family over to the U.S. Her parents had, a, I think, a duplex in the Trump Tower. Her sister got a job with the Trump organization designing ties or something. So she made sure her family was taken care of. She was taken care of. Like Trump was just a way for her to live this life of nice clothes, spas, vacations. Um, I don't know. I think she's just like mirrors all the way in and all the way down. Hmm. Well, what this book, um, Melania and me, I mean, it's been very controversial. Uh, the, the author, Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, was this huge event planner, worked for Vogue, staged the Met Gala, um, comes from sort of New York high society by, by stepfather association. Harry Winston is her, uh, was her father-in-law. Her mother married the son of Harry Winston, the jeweler. Um, and she took his name at the age of 26, which is sort of weird. So when the Trumps, when Donald Trump got elected, Melania sort of hired her to oversee some of the inaugural events and the balls. And um, and then she subsequently went and worked for her for about a year, year and a half in the East Wing, um, unpaid, uh, as she will tell us. But there's been so much now scandal around this because she was the person who initially was said to have been paid $28 million by the presidential inaugural committee, which she says is not true. Um, so it looked like she joined up to get a big crony bag of money. And then she's also recently uh, in promoting the book, um, re releasing tapes, re secret recordings of her conversations with Melania, where Melania complains about having to do the Christmas decorations, talks <laughs> about how little she cares about things. Um, and, and of course, this has not redounded so much on Melania as it has on, on the authors. Like what sort of woman slash friend secretly records you? So I think a lot of what she had to say in the book, I mean, I just found the book fascinating because she was friends with her for 15 years. 
She was there at the beginning of the creation of the fashionable high society Melania, which she was not when they first met. And I think some of that has gotten lost in the coverage. And I'm sort of more interested in talking to her. I mean, I guess we'll ask her about some of this stuff, but I just want to hear the details of Melania pre White House and then post White House. I mean, what was your reaction to the book? You know, I found it to be a fascinating anthropological document, you know, like the, both the source and the subject are so problematic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, when we were getting ready for this podcast, you know, Michael Cohen taped Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, you know, and everybody was taping each other and nobody trusted yeah, they each They were other. friends. They were like longtime acquaintances. So. Yeah, but it's just, I, <laughs> I know, but I just, I found that kind of not super surprising. It just, yeah. that, that world, I think in New York, and then especially the part of that world that acquiesced to and eagerly joined the White House seems so kind of morally corrupt and kind of um, want very different things in life from people like you and me. And it just seemed like, you know, I mentioned this again before, but it all reinforces for me this idea that that, that world is, you know, in English, it's called a snake pit. In Russian, it's called a terrarium. Mm. Just, you know, a really toxic, vicious, backstabbing environment where you don't really trust anyone. And her descriptions of their friendship before 2016 also struck me as like, what did they, you know, they talked about their kids and their schools and what they're going to dress up for as Halloween, for Halloween. And their and charity functions and the, her, her son had some terrible allergy, um, nut allergy and got involved in charities for that. But yeah, basically it was sort of two hour lunches. And, and the other thing is, Julia, and I think we have to up this game between us and really all our female friends. We don't use enough emojis in our text oh, messages. Kind of emojis. <laughs> I couldn't believe all the emoji, like half of, it was like hieroglyphics or something, like <laughs> half of their texts between them when they'd be reproduced in the book were all these like, a string of eight emojis and um you know when you don't have that much to say <laughs> I, guess like, I guess what I'm wondering is how do you do that during a lunch IRL right like <laughs> just, just type in some emojis and then show the screen <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so it's it's I don't know it's it's fascinating I'm I'm, I'm very keen to have her on and um and uh just yeah let's get the whole story yeah, let's do it. If you're like me, you've gotten pretty used to shopping online lately for even very basic things like toilet paper or cleaning products. You probably don't get excited by deliveries anymore. Oh boy, dog food again. But here's something you can order that will not just brighten your doorstep, but your home, yard, or patio for many years to come. A gorgeous shrub, tree, or plant from fastgoingtrees.com. Best of all, home delivery allows you to skip the big box stores and head to fastgrowingtrees.com, the world's largest online nursery. No more waiting in lines, messy cars, and digging through a lackluster selection. Just go to fastgrowingtrees.com and choose from thousands of varieties of trees, shrubs, and plants, expertly curated to thrive in your area and delivered to your door in one or two days. Whether you're looking for shade, privacy, fruit trees, or just added color for your yard, Every plant is shipped with a well-developed root system, ready to explode with new growth come spring. I've not only ordered a beautiful limelight hydrangea for my garden, because fall is actually the best time to plant, but I'm looking forward to stocking up on some house plants for the winter and bring some greenery inside. So there's a better way to buy trees and shrubs and plants for your home and yard, fastgrowingtrees.com. Join over 1 million satisfied gardeners at fastgrowingtrees.com. Plus, the 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. And now, through November 15th, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash femsplainers for 10% off. That's 10% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash femsplainers. Stephanie 
welcome to the Femsplainers. Thank you for having me on. Well, you've been on a, a number of podcasts this week, including Michael Cohen's, I, I, I heard. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very interesting. It was actually my first <laughs> podcast. Oh, really? Well, it's, yes. you've been on quite a tour and, and created quite a stir. Uh, we're, um, we're very interested in going back to the beginning and some of the background. Um, and one of the f- fascinating things is, um, you know, your work with Vogue and your work with the Met Gala. Uh, you wrote that you met Melania in 2003. You were both 32, so you're an exact contemporary of Melania's. Mm -hmm. And you were sort of present at the creation of her. That Talk about, and Anna Wintour was involved, that it was as if you were tasked with this job to take model Melania and turn her into something that could be more presentable in New York society. So... Please yeah, tell us. I have to, you know, um, it was um, serendipitous. Like, really, it really wasn't, um, you know, she was just a pretty girl and a pretty face when she first came into Vogue. Um, Andre, Leon Talley, and I sat next to each other in the office, and uh, we were introduced to Melania. Uh, again, at the time, she was Donald Trump's girlfriend, so we didn't think anything of it. Um, and then Andre was tasked with... Uh, Melania's rollout, really, to her wedding day. So it was, I think, unknowingly, really, again, for me, as I saw her and I was so close to Andre, I we be, befriended one another. And so I, I became more immersed and involved in um, watching her, as you said, turn from model to super cover, you know, super role, uh, supermodel. And um, our friendship just blossomed because we did, we, we would go to lunch once a month um, and there was a connectivity. And at the time, mom was very shy, quiet, um, reserved. And um, as she is today, but it just comes across very differently um, when you actually understand the whole Melania um, and understand the reason why there is that reservation and why there is that mystique, um, which is truly to protect her, I think, from um, whatever it is that she doesn't want to reveal um, to others. But at the time, I um, I just, you know, watched Andre and Anna um, take Milani to different shows, Fashion Week shows, as well as events. Um, you know, as it says, you know, Andre Leontali took Melania to Martha Graham. So she's now a Martha, you know, dance expert. Like, mm-hmm. so I think the, the, the Melania evolved through Vogue's experience um, as a way of leading her down, you know, to the red carpet, literally at the Met Gala as her coming out. And so in order to do that, she was going to be presented as, you know, Donald Trump's fiance that evening. And so the year and a half that led up to that was um, the creation of this legitimacy of who Donald Trump was going to be marrying. It legitimized her by being a Vogue cover model, but it also really legitimized him, right? Because at the time, Prentice was like the biggest, you know, show on, on, on networks and he needed to be branded as well differently. And so he, uh, in my opinion, he used the brand of Vogue, which again, doesn't get much better. The resources that were already there. So he wouldn't have to actually, you know, take anything out of his pocket to, to make it happen. And, um, and the people, the stage was set, the, the, the characters were in place, the friends were made. And I think I fit that mold in a way that I didn't realize at the time as just, um, I was the perfect friend. I was the perfect, um, Vogue friend who opened the doors for Melania because a lot of people want to think it's the other way around right oh you wanted to be with a Trump it, it's entirely not um the case right in, in the fashion and entertainment industry that was my world and so making sure Melania was on the guest list and making sure Melania was at the on the red carpet and making sure it was all part of the presentation can I ask uh, why? What was in it for Vogue, and what was in it for you guys? I mean, no, from I, what I from what I remember at the time, you know, Donald Trump was kind of a clown, you know, and it, it, I lived in New York at the time. He was kind of a clown, and he's dating, you know, uh, and he's and she also was not 
even like she was doing catalog modeling from what I understand. Right. So like, why did you guys even do this? So that's what I'm saying is I just happened to be sitting next to Andre. Our offices were next to her, right? Melania came in. Right, but why Vogue? Why was Vogue? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, yeah exactly. I, I was just, I was going to ask the same thing, Julia. It's like, it sounds like almost like something like the 19th century, that some figure as if from the aristocracy, although I think, as Julia says, that wasn't really the perception of Donald Trump comes in and the society ladies say, oh, my dear, we must take her. She can't go out like this. And, <laughs> right, and right. we must get her dressed and show her where to shop and what to wear. And and it's weird. But like, why? Why did Anna why Wintour care? care? Right. I think it just evolved that way. I think Donald and Mark Burnett knew they needed to produce the next show. and. Who better than the ace in the hole, as I say in the book, Anna, would unknowingly, right? I think it's prob- possible that Anna, Donald, you know, wanted to introduce his, his to become fiance. And here all of a sudden was the opportunity to, again, if you're going to present her in bow, you've got to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. And it just evolved. It wasn't like it was planned. Do you see what I'm saying? The right. friendship evolved, the going to the events evolved, sitting at that front rows evolved. So I really don't think any of us were aware at the time of the roles we were playing mm. in this. Here's the thing. So I am so tunnel vision. And I unfortunately, <laughs> I live my life like that. And that's what's gotten me in trouble a lot of times, especially with this group of people. Um, I work, I mean, I, I, I'm i into my job. I have my three children, my family. I know that sounds, but it is what it is. Like. I didn't understand politics. I didn't even actually, unfortunately, to my detriment, I didn't know enough. I didn't study. I didn't learn. Um, I really thought I could separate ethics and policy. And you can't, right? You, you, it, I, I learned the hard way. But what I'm trying to say is, to me, Melania just was a girl. I didn't know her background. I didn't judge Don. I never saw The Apprentice. Like, I really had, I never even spent time with him. That's why I thought there was so much life between the two of them which is I didn't have, I, I mean, I'd see him at an event, but I never had that one-on-one with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did see some, the differences between them. She was quiet. He was loud. Our friendship really got much closer and, and we, we became, um, we spoke a lot more about personal things when Donald decided to run um, and become a candidate. And um, to, before that, it really was, we'd spend time as mothers, really. It was more about, we'd see each other. She didn't have many friends. So there was that simpatico, like there was just, you feel, and I know it's a very strange thing to say, you feel like um, you have that friend that nobody else can befriend and they look to you and when they see you, their eyes sparkle and then you can see that there's like this moment of joy because they know they can trust you. They know they can say things to you. They know they can be with mm. you. And I think I was that to her. And it made me feel special too. You know what I'm saying? Because again, I didn't, I don't, I didn't judge her for Donald and I didn't judge her for what she did or didn't do. I, I met her. She was, I, I liked her. She, we were, you know, she was getting ready for the Met ball at the time. Everything goes so fast. I wasn't contemplating the reasons behind why all of it was happening. When I read the book, it's almost like there's this Pygmalion quality to it. And you helped her get her footing in this world. And I continue to do that every single day, which is mind blowing because most of the or most of the country does still think that she is this, you know, the free Melania memes that go around that she's trapped and she can't, you know, uh, do anything. She is the most complicit Mm -hmm. woman. And you know, it's like, she is, um, she is Donald's biggest cheerleader. She is, if not the, the thing, at least with Donald is we both know that they need attention and we both know what they do when they're criticized. The difference is Donald will come back after you. He will, you know, stew in that moment. Whereas Melania, she literally does not care whatsoever what you think about her. And that still wall around her is impenetrable. And she says it and she believes it. And that's how she really is. She does not turn around and go home and cry one bit. People say, people can say whatever they want about her. And she says, look, 
If I can't control their emotions, I can't control how they feel about me. Then why should I even concern myself with what somebody thinks of me? And she means it. Well, that was one of the most fascinating takeaways I, I had from your book was there really is no secret side to her, even though she is so sphinx like even during the campaign that she was not on the campaign trail, you'd be getting texts from her in the Caribbean where she'd be saying like, so nice, hate to leave or <laughs> from a golf car to the resort. Like she just did what she wanted to do. And, and continue even to in so. the first six months, tell me if I'm wrong, when she didn't want to come to Washington, we all thought, oh, she's so upset. He won. She didn't want this life. Um, and, uh, and, and, and now and it had nothing to do that with that. It was just convenient for her and for Barron to stay in New York. The White House wasn't renovated. And I was there. Feel, and right. And she felt I, no, I went to set up the White House. Right. She felt no need. Like she never felt that she was, I guess, had to give back something to the American people. responsibility. Right. Right. I mean, it is the biggest honor to hold that position. It's an honorary position. But my God, the ability to do and say and be heard. And like I said the other night, you know, for Donald, he's the one voice that we need in our female empowerment to be able to speak loudly is she has no voice. Melania has no voice on our behalf. And that to me is troubling. And that is why one of the biggest reasons, besides the fact that the White House kept calling me a liar and paranoid that I did release um, some of the tapes, was because I want people to be able, I, I'm done protecting them. I've protected them for a very long time. People that for themselves need to hear that she does not care and that she is not concerned about the American people. She's there because she is married to the president of the United States. That's it. And she's going to do the least amount possible, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's tragic and tragedy that happened because we at the in the beginning, she wanted to actually make a difference. Was I reading into it? Perhaps she had the ability to make a difference, and she didn't. And that, to me, um, after everything that happened during the planning of the inauguration, the setup of my life and the takedown of my life, and being intimately involved in it knowing it was happening. And she was, again, at the time she had my back. So I felt safe. But the second that she became complicit in that, the second that she said to me, look, there's going to be an investigation. The lawyers told us there's going to be an investigation and I am not allowed to say anything on your behalf. And I broke down saying, Melania, all you have to do is say that I wasn't fired. I mean, the first article wasn't true either. I think it had $26 million, but that I just didn't want to, the world was seeing me as culpable. The world was seeing me as this friend who danced off with $26 million, which wasn't true. But they internally, the correspondence and the lead up to that was very, it's, that's why I think this betrayal for me, not I think, the betrayal was so much worse for me. Not only did I give up my entire career, I mean, everything. I did, divested all businesses. I, um, you know, it's beyond the opportunity cost. I, every relationship, and I value my relationships. It's what my life is all about. I've built my, you know, my legacy, my work on my relationships, and they're important to me. And so the fact that they would use my relationships and then abuse me, it was so difficult to comprehend. And I still, again, um, it's still dramatic and traumatic because I was in the hospital. I almost died for them. So I had a question. Uh, there's been a lot of rumors about this, especially given that, you know, Melania didn't want to move uh, to D.C. with Barron at first. She wanted him to finish, uh, finish school in New York. And I was wondering... Um, you know, how's Barron adjusting to all of this? There's been rumors that he has, uh, that he's also on the spectrum. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, how, what is his relationship like with his father? Um, I guess, where does he fit into the family from what you've seen? So, 
as you notice in the book, I did stay away from talking about Baron um, because I have spent a lot of time with Baron. I've watched him grow up. And um, I do respect the fact that it's a parent's place to talk about their children. Um, I think that Melania and I were able to bond over certain, um, you know, children issues that relate to um, children just needing more support in different ways. Um, but, you know, Melania's whole take on boys will be boys um, is really also how she handles, I think, um, situations with Baron that if something happens where he's doing something he shouldn't be doing or, you know, as opposed to taking that moment to reflect on it, make it a teaching moment and understand the next steps. It's more like, you know, it's more grow up and, and have more of an independence, which is what she's taught him to be more like her, um, the strength. And that, unfortunately, um, you know, I, I think a perfect example is when, that when I was accused and I had fallen apart from it, um, I mean, she said to me, it's the same thing how she feels when I said my children were so torn, they couldn't imagine what I'd done for her that she wouldn't come out and say anything. And she said to me, well, you have to explain to your children that in life, this, these are the things that happen and you have to be able to get right back up, stand tall and keep moving forward. And I, I was like, I mean, and this was after our friend, this is when I did, when I was uh, no longer her friend and she was no longer my friend. Um, it, but that to me was exactly how I view her relationship, um, not only with her husband, but with her son. And she is, they are very close, but Baron is, you know, a teenage boy who loves sports. Um, he, you know, again, I just don't feel comfortable. Hmm discussing that part. What about Trump's relationship to Barron, how Trump views Barron? Um, so I think I did explain a little bit in the book that Melania knew who she was marrying in Donald. She knew that she wasn't going to be, I think, getting the most devoted and adoring husband or father. Um, they both had their reasons. And I do, when I say it's transactional, there were so many different reasons for them both wanting to be married to one another. But having a child for her was what she wanted. Um, and she knew he wasn't going to be home changing diapers. And she says that. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, she, she said that. that very famously. Yeah. Very famously. And I, you know, I would sit there and say to her, oh, I would complain like David would go play golf on Saturdays. Like that was my big thing. I wanted him home on Saturday mornings. And she would, you know, her, her advice when it came to these kind of things was if you can't change it, same thing with how people think, if you can't change it, why even think about it? Why upset yourself over it? As opposed to just, I mean, and she is just let it be. If wants to play golf, mm -hmm. let him play golf, you know, which actually I did, which was, I was like, oh, no big deal. But again, that's a little different, but that's how she lives her life. And, um, well, Donald, and you pointed out it's, he, she was, she's always been secretive. I mean, I think it's sort of sad. I understand the desire, of course, to protect your child in the White House. And the press have always been respectful of that. But he's been the least visible child. Um, we got to know, I mean, it's sort of sweet to watch the Obama girls grow up or the, mm -hmm. the Bush girls and, and Chelsea. Chelsea. And we we haven't seen, I mean, we see endless amounts of the elder children but we don't see anything of him. And, and but you say the secrecy about her motherhood predates going into the White House. She's always been quite secret about these things. She she has been. And when people would ask her how Baron's doing, she would say he's great. Um, you know, those words that beautiful, great, amazing. Um, I mean, she would share tremendous. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. But yeah, you know, but she would have these exchanges with me where she'd talk about his Halloween costume and, you know, how cute he looked or, um, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, the sincerity that she has in, in, in the sweetness of the relationship. But at the same time, you know, I would have dinner with my daughter when I was with her, uh, with Melania and, and Donald in Mar-a-Lago. This it was one time, but I realized at that time, because we started spending more and more time because I was working for her was if Baron didn't want to come, Baron didn't have to come. Mm -hmm. And that's the exactly when you say like, you know, the, the Christmas tree is coming and the turkey like Baron, if he didn't want to be there, he didn't have to be there where I 
was like, my kids have to be here. Right. I mean, there is no rhyme or reason why they wouldn't be, but it's part of who she is. It doesn't have to do with so much with um, everything has to see. This is so complicated to explain because everything and you get this. Everything needs to remain a mystique. Like everything needs to remain this facade. Like I'm not going to call it a portrait, but what it really is, is a mm. facade. I believe that by not allowing you into any part of her real world, which is she burying her parents, yeah. you are unable. And again, she has said this to me. If you don't give them the information, they've got nothing to talk about. And that is exactly what she's doing. And you never even saw her with like unwashed hair, like your friendship with her. You, you said that she always comes at before she is perfectly quaffed, always in the high heels. I mean, I've seen her in her, you know, without makeup on or, you know, I, I mean, I've had some time, you know, I've, I have seen her kind of like in a ponytail. And it, yeah. so there were times, but not many. I mean, yeah. not many at all. She right. just always was done. Right. So is there uh, anything in there? Because I, I remember, you, you know, like being in Slovenia and talking to her very long term ex-boyfriend. And he was like, yeah, there's just, you know, she's just very private and reserved and quiet. And there's just not much in there. See, here's the thing, though. Again, this is where the split comes in. There's there's this. Um, again, I had this connection with her where she did share. So I would, I would share. And so the, we did have that connection. There is in there, there's a there's there in Melania, but she's not sharing it with anyone. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day where you would go to bed at night and you would still concern yourself, like even with Michael Cohen tape with Stormy, like I am shattered that that is what it turned into over Twitter between Stormy and Melania. To me, that was not the intent of that. I didn't even mm -hmm. dream that that would become, again. I, oh, this is, this no is time. when um, Stormy replied you, to, in one of your recorded re released tapes that Melania called her the porn hooker, I think. And and then yeah. Stormy then replied, and that's that's been over this past week. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. Oh, I miss this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my again, god. On hooker. The other thing too is that it's in the book, so I am only speaking about what's already written in the book. In the book, I say mm. it's the whole. Again, it's our conversation about the porn hooker, and so, <laughs> but I have her saying it like that, and I said the what because I didn't know who what she was talking about. And she said, Stormy. Now, again, I went to bed feeling like, oh, my God, I, f I feel badly that that's out on tape. Again, that's we have these feelings that we have to look at ourselves the next day and say, uh, you know. Again, normally you I would it's still it's still just who she I am. I she was never flustered in all of these things that you describe. She never batted an eye and and uh, and, and was frequently saying, why do you care so much about it, Stephanie? I don't. And that was true of the initiative. That was true. But let's go to um, Ivanka, because there was a lot of that, uh, that, del that the, the, the war between both the two wings of the White House, the West and East, and between them. Uh, talk about what you were on Team Mel uh, Melania, as you would say, but you had to have a team. Um, and the well, two we were Nobody trusted we were just each two other. People on the same team. That was it. I mean, there was the two of us, and then everyone right. else with Team Ivanka. Ooh. Okay. So we're going to pause this episode here and continue with part two of our interview with Stephanie Winston Walkoff next episode. We'll get further into the details of the rivalry between Melania and Ivanka. We'll learn more about the Trump marriage and how Melania first reacted to breaking news of her husband's infidelities. And we'll find out what finally led this now pretty toxic friendship to implode. If this feels like the real Housewives of Washington, well, it is kind of, except sadly that it is real. Enjoying the Femsplainers? Please consider becoming a supporter at patreon.com Femsplainers. We really depend on our listeners' donations to keep going. Pledge whatever you can, whether it's the price of a cup of coffee, maybe even a fancy cocktail each month. We'd like that. And in return, you'll receive our monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter and our exclusive subscribers-only episode, Last Call, 
in which you get to ask our guests questions. You'll see even more benefits if you go to patreon.com slash femsplainers. And thank you to all of you who continue to support us every month. We truly can't do this without you. See you next episode for the juicy part two of Melania and Me. The Femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the Ricochet Network and available pretty much on every podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers and get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum. <laughs>